If you weren't here all of last Sunday, then you really missed a blessing. I think we went about two and a half hours after two and a half hours of teaching that morning. Five hour extended teaching there. Some of the most important things that I've said since I've been to this church were said during that two and a half hour period. I think it was all off the record. It's too bad someone didn't forget and leave the machine going back there. And you know, it all came as a cause of some questions that people began asking afterwards. I've said that before. That's the way that you learn, asking questions. I don't know if they took us up specifically on that basis or you just get curious about different things and, and desire to start asking some questions about that. Uh, I don't have any intention this evening because that was all so, well, just over our head discussion is what it was. I don't have any intention of trying to sum it all up tonight because I don't even know all that was said. <laughs> I really don't. Two and a half hours of just deep, deep talking about some deep subjects. Uh, some of you are still here. We got an audience seated in the back of the room towards the end of it when they <laughs> found out what was going on. Then people started filing back in, sitting down in chairs. Some of you don't know what I'm talking about. Now you were home having a duck dinner or something. But the rest of us were still here eating over the Word of God. And that's, that's really what it was. So we're not, we're not ch chastening you. We're just saying we feel sorry for you that you weren't here the whole time. I really mean that. Some of the most important things that, well, I feel this, that I've said since I've been here at this church were said during that two and a half hour period, talking about just some deep things concerning the word of God. It comes out many times in ways like that, that it just doesn't come out whenever I'm up here teaching along some particular line. Because, again, you have so much interaction. And I, I trust that more of you are really thinking that we've set the wheels turning in your mind the last nine or 12 months or so. I suppose just about everyone here thinks that whenever I hope that you assume this, that whenever I make a statement up here, a certain type of statement, that the odds would be in your favor if you would suppose that I mean more than what I'm really saying. Now, I assume that all of us are to that place by now. Well, Lord, help you if you're not there yet. If you think, well, I heard that, that the charismatic movement's not of God. I heard that, so... Let's go on beyond that now. No, we really don't need to go beyond that now. The charismatic movement is not of God. And I hope you're sitting out there assuming now there's more to it than just that. But although I think a lot of you are to that place now, you're assuming that I'm assuming that you're thinking beyond just what I'm saying. But I think probably no one here is taking things to the furthest extent possible on the basis of some comment that I've made about something. Not to misinterpret me. Now, if I say something, you say, oh, you mean that Christianity is not a valid religion. Well, I'm not thinking along that line. I'm thinking along a different line. Some people say, well, I'm going to start really taking things far. Well, you end up in heresy then. <laughs> you take things too far. You have to take it and keep on the same track that we're on, whatever we're saying. You say, well, why don't you just say it? Because, well, in the first place, I don't want to go ahead or beyond of what God wants for us at this time. In the second place, I don't know if some people are ready for it. I just tremble at the thought of even preparing to make some of the statements that I would like to make. And some of them just came out last Sunday. And... You know, I don't know exactly where every person here is, whether you're really ready to handle these things and ready to receive these things. And then in the third place, a lot of times 
there, there, there's somewhere in my subconscious mind, and it takes something to dislodge that. Some things I'm thinking about all the time, and they're just there. There are other things that are there, and all it takes is someone asking a question, and I say, I know exactly what the answer to that question is. It's been something that, oh, over the years, I've been tottering around the brink of falling into that pit of asking myself that question, and then going on to disprove, disprove what I've heard everyone say about that. And since, you know, you kind of already know that yourself, that sometimes makes you want to steer clear of getting over into an area like that. It just makes you, makes me tremble even to think of saying some of these things, saying them as far as I could say them. As far as I know that they're true, but maybe, maybe we're not all ready for it at one time. Maybe that's why some people stayed and other people weren't here. Maybe it was just time for some of those people. Maybe you were already thinking. Maybe some of those people needed to be thinking about some things. Uh, I don't know. About the only time that I don't mean more than what I say is when I make a statement along the line of, well, I just cannot quite communicate to you what I mean by this. Well, then how could you mean any more than that? If you can't communicate it, that's how far it goes. It's something that can't be communicated. And I've said that recently about several things. I've said that about something as, as simple and maybe to some people as seemingly innocuous as taking a trip over to Israel. You would come back a different person. And I think that's true of every person here. Unless maybe you, you flew over like over the cuckoo's nest and looked down and then went on somewhere else. I mean to go, you go the way I went. It would change your life and it would change the way you think about things. <coughs> the, the charismatic movement out there is interpreting the Bible on a charismatic basis, pulling verses out of context just if it will help them. They have all these things memorized in a neat little fashion and in a neat little order to prove how speaking in tongues is still valid for today and to prove why and how divine healing is still valid for today. And you know, there are little verses that people have memorized that will speak to subjects like that. But does that look like, you know, when you study all of Paul's writings, does that seem like that's his favorite topic to keep bringing up in all of his epistles and start laboring away preaching about that? And then that makes you wonder, well, is, is it even valid or is our opinion of these verses a misconception of these verses and not a true, biblically based to the languages, to the history, to the grammar, to the context, to the construction, to the usage, interpretation of what's really being said here. I'm telling you, we've got a long way to go. I, I've had, in my Christian life, I've had many places, many times where you come to a period of changes in your life. But I've never had a time where the change has been as significant as it's been in the last 9 to 12 months. Amen. And that's in a decade now of Christian experience. With many different times where you come to a new plateau, a new understanding, and God begins to work something and change something in your life. But I can say that none of those times have been as significant as have been the last 12 months of my own life. Amen. Changes, 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 and thank the Lord for them. What if we had stayed in a certain train of thought in a certain pattern? Then you end up running out of steam and just spinning your wheels the rest of your life for the rest of your ministry. Who is really from the first day to the last day of their life gone, gone, gone on with the Lord? They always will go for a period. And then some will backslide into some sin, or some don't backslide. They just kind of stop right where they are. They've run out of steam because there's no new coal to throw in the engine. There's nothing new to keep things going. They just come to a standstill, but keep saying, well, praise God, we're still a train, though, aren't we? We're still a train. We're still a train. But they're sitting there. A few are sliding backwards. Some are just sitting there, not going on anywhere with God. 
And like I said a moment ago, you know, it's been the last 12 months where these things have, and you know what has been the impetus for all of this, where these things have just burst upon the scene. But I think I can say with all honesty that that for years in some of these areas I've just been tottering on the brink of you know falling over into really getting into that question and the only reason I never fell over into it is because I suspected all along and my journal will bear this out now you see because it's dated like 1977 so that proves that it's not something I just thought of in 1982 it means it's something I thought of in 1977 it will prove that although I don't invite you to read through all of it, though, but it will prove it. It proves it to me anyway, and I trust you believe what I'm telling you, that it's true. But I suspected that if I got into that, I could disprove what all the charismatics were saying about it, and I didn't really want to do that. I mean, I'm just telling you the honest truth. I didn't really want to do that because then you have to think to yourself, then where is there to go? Amen. If you came out of institutional religion into the charismatic movement and the charismatic movement can prove that institutional religion is Babylon and it's not of God and then you can prove that those who prove another group is Babylon is Babylon itself then what are you going to do where are you going to go then Amen. it's a frightening thought Amen. you know you're kind of all on your own then and we're not trying to claim you know anything that's not true of us but it's been true and, and you know that it's been true that and I don't mean this in the bad sense of the word, but that we have been a rebel and a maverick in many areas, just not conforming to what everyone else wanted us to do or expected of us, even though we knew what we could gain by doing what others said. Whether we're talking about our days in a certain Bible school, all you have to do is start sounding like the rest of them. And they loved our knowledge of the Bible. Oh, you should have heard the reports I heard second, third hand from people. That fella knows the Bible like no one I've ever seen but 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 they'd always say some but things after that all I do is just conform a few things and then with my knowledge of the Bible you just run over people who don't know anything about the Bible who are up there doing all the teaching all it took was a little conformity to their way of life and to their way of belief and to uh, their way of thinking in theology and then there is an opening you can have a following right there I've never been tempted to do that, but I mean the thought has passed my mind. How have these people just arisen from nowhere, a businessman over here, a banker here, a farmer there, and now they're leading charismatic teachers? What if you really knew the Word of God? These people don't know the Bible. They try to, try to <laughs> quote a verse and stumble along and give you the wrong reference. What if you really knew the Bible? You were a sharp teacher of the Word of God, but you conformed your ways to their ways. Couldn't you probably even be higher than a lot of those people? But you've got to have their way of thought and their mannerisms. You've got to kick your feet. You've got to use a see-through, transparent pulpit. And you've got to be like the rest of them. Every group has its own little things that if you will conform to their ways and to their train of thought, but if you're superior in your knowledge, then wouldn't that make you superior if you entered their group? Well, probably, unless God was keeping his hand on you so much he just made you a miserable failure even though you were real bright which would be okay with us if we want to stay true to God's way and his word and other groups who might not have transparent messages and transparent pulpits but who have a little more still there are certain things that we have to we have to conform in our life to their way of thinking and to their way of life before we'll be accepted there have been so many groups that have arisen, I guess, down through history, saying, we are the group. I guess everyone or you wouldn't be part of a group. We are the group. The Baptists say that. We know the Catholics say that. Various charismatic splinter groups say that. This is the group. This is the group. This is the group. And as far as I can see, in looking at all of them, none of them have been the group. It seems like just about everyone has had a little smattering of truth somewhere. Some more than others. But everyone has stopped short of the extent of what's really meant by so many, many, many things in the Word of God. I mean, to give you what is to us recent, 
last few months, but old had example, Proverbs 6, 2. When I first began hearing the way that was taught, my mind says that's not exactly what's being said there. But I've never heard any positive thinking and positive confession teaching before, so we've got to have verses for it. So there's a good verse. And it sounds good. Thou art snared with the words of thy mouth. That even sounds good. And so you pick that right out of its context and incorporate that into your positive thinking and confession book, implying the whole time. I don't care if someone tells me, well, I really knew that it didn't mean that. You're not telling me that you knew that it really didn't mean that. You're still implying the whole time the one reason that verse was written was to put in my 33-page charismatic manual on positive thinking and confession. That's what I thought about it. Oh, how dumb and naive I used to be. But I want to tell you something, dear friends. You're looking at someone tonight who's not dumb and who's not naive about these things anymore. And I'm glad that I'm not, and that's what is upsetting some people everybody as long as you'll be dumb a dumb sheep then praise God you can join my church if you'll be a dumb sheep don't be a rebellious one and we don't mean rebellious in the wrong sense the Bible teaches submission to leadership but at the same time the Bible teaches that you are to have some independence yourself you can't just put your head in a hole in the sand and say well whatever is told in my ears must be the truth or it wouldn't be told in my ears so I'm just going to believe that I mean the Christianity wouldn't even exist probably today someone had to start giving up what someone was feeding them in their ears and say but let's get back to the word of God though Hallelujah. or I'm sure it'd be a dead religion today someone had to put their foot down and it's happened many times and they sometimes only put their foot down in certain areas and then don't continue to take things to the limit to the extent that I'm speaking of tonight, which is all the way back to the Word of God. I wonder if you'll turn over to Isaiah, to a favorite verse of mine in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 8. There's a whole spirit of delusion running through all of the charismatic teaching out there today. We have a message or two, I believe, on that subject. Probably many of them, but I mean a few specifically. The whole message devoted to that. And, you know, I guess we can kind of refresh our memory of that again just to hear me say it and to hear yourself say it in your own mind. The charismatic movement's not even of God. It's not even planned of God, not even of God's Spirit. And, you know... <laughs> Wow, what a statement to make. You know, being a part of the outpouring of the Spirit of God that we believe is valid for today, but to say that the charismatic movement is not of God, not in any part, not in any fashion. That there is a deluding spirit, a train of thought. Oh, and I, this is, again, something I just can hardly communicate, but it is a spirit, or how or, or why are they all picking up the same type of thing? It's a stopping short of the Word of God but a deluding spirit that runs through the entire charismatic movement. Good groups and bad groups as well, I'm afraid to say. Good groups and bad groups as well. One time I didn't realize that, but I realize it more and more now. Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 20. It's just a crying shame that the Bible was ever divided up into chapters and verses like it's been. There are a lot of good things we could say about that, how it helps us locate things and helps us memorize, and all of that's true, but those good points don't outweigh the bad points that we can say about the division. And it's just a crying shame that we aren't all half Jew and half Greek so we can speak both of the languages fluently so that we don't even bring men's translations of the Bible with us I just wish we could pray for a miracle just to throw away all of our Bibles except for our Greek and Hebrew Bibles. You know, wouldn't that be something to come and just speak in Hebrew and Greek all the time? Oh, 
You know, you can just dream like dreaming for a vacation in Hawaii, but more than that, dream that something like that could be a reality. I mean, we're just reading someone's version, someone's translation of the Bible. It's so inadequate. It's so inferior. Obviously, you can get saved. God saw down through history that the whole world's not going to speak Hebrew and Greek. And the world can still get saved out of probably just about any Bible, although I don't know about the Living Bible, whether you could really get saved out of that or good news for modern man. It's bad news for modern man as far as I'm concerned. And King James is not that much better, but it's not as bad as the Living Bible or good news or all these little 20th century paraphrased editions of the Bible. But, you know, just in turning back here, you see, I'm going to use Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 20, but I almost want to apologize because, you know, if we had the time, what we should do is before we ever even turn to a verse, this is the way I really feel, is we should read the chapter in the Hebrew, we should have already done the study of Isaiah and know exactly what Isaiah's prophecy and his ministry is all about. Amen. So we don't pull this verse out and say, now, what this verse, this verse 20 means is that one day in 1985, then you can just tell everyone around you now, if your message doesn't line up with the Bible, according to Isaiah 20, then I'm not going to follow you. Yeah, that's a shallow view to have, even though that's, that's correct interpretation of what, according to what we're going to read here. If that's all you see, do you see what I'm saying? If that's all you see, if that's all you know, you can just flip over to Isaiah 8.20 and use it as a proof text against someone. That's really not fair and that's really not right. And that's really not the purpose of the Word of God being written anyway. The purpose is not so we can memorize a few verses, one over here and one over there. It's so we can be totally familiar with the whole Word of God. Or why was the whole Word of God written? Amen. Why didn't he just give us one verse in chapter 8, which would be verse 20, the most famous verse in the chapter, for those of us that think along a certain train of thought. That's a problem. That's what I don't like about the whole thing. And there's so much more I can say about this in case you think, well, if you're saying all this and we've got to practice it, somehow we've got to get rid of all this because then when you do get over to the New Testament, Paul will just pull one verse out of some passage that in that context is really not speaking to the issue that Paul uses it for. But by the anointing of the Spirit, he applies it in a second manner that must be a true manner after all. But yet most people aren't informed that that does happen in the preaching and in the epistles of Paul. And we haven't even got to teach on that yet. I'll be glad when we can get to that so you can see how as long as we all know what we're talking about, then certain things are valid. But the problem is generally nobody knows what anybody's talking about. Even the minister, he just flips over to Isaiah 8.20 and pounds from the pulpit about that. And nobody really knows anything about what's going on. I wonder what all of chapter 8 is about. When he says to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, well, what's he really talking about there? Is he really meaning now you have to be able to base what you're saying on Matthew or on the New Testament? Or we're not going to follow you. That proves that you're deluded. There's no light. There's no truth in you. What is all this peeping and muttering talking about there? How can you make a connection, or is there a connection? And if it, if it exists, what is it between the 19th and the 20th verse? Um, I just happen to be, they just coincide, reading some people's comments on this, and it's interesting to see what they have to say, but I was going to use Isaiah 8.20 anyway. So let's, after all of that negation of the verse, let's take it and see what it positively says. To the law into the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Well, our surface interpretation of the verse happens to be correct. It's just that there's so much more you can get out of so many things in the word of God if you go deeper than just a surface view. It's good to know because in Proverbs 6, 2, people's surface view is not correct by any stretch of the imagination. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. You see, down, and that's what we have to measure people and their groups and their claims by, is the word of God. Not them telling us, well, 
What we're teaching you is the Word of God, but we encourage you to go check these things out. But when you check them out, you'll find out that they are the Word of God. Well, there's no sense in checking it out then. If you're saying things in that matter, and the people that have said that, you check it out, it's not in line with the Word of God. It's very interesting how you can reason around in a circle about so many different things. Some people don't even think about it. You know, I've been encouraged by certain groups to only follow the Word of God. That's the emphasis of their ministry is only follow the Word of God. And when I try to really follow the Word, if I believe the Word contradicts them, they'll have nothing to do with me then. When I'm doing the one thing they told me to be sure to do, don't follow a man or his view or his interpretation unless it lines up totally with the Word of God. Be as the Bereans, receive the word in meekness and gladness and joy and, and don't receive it with a rebellious attitude and then go and search the scriptures daily to see if these things be so. And then when I've attempted to do that, I've searched it and I found out these things were not so. And the people who told me to go and search won't even listen to anything contrary to what they have said themselves before. Now, what can, what can you do? You know, you're fighting a losing battle then. Yeah. You've got someone who's defined everything in such a way that nothing can ever affect them. You can do that in politics. You can do it in any field. You can define everything in such a way that your theories can never, ever be challenged. You can't even be challenged. Because then as soon as you challenge, they say, well, you're not supposed to challenge God's ministers because God doesn't set dummies in the pulpit. We know what we're talking about. You see, you're, you work yourself into a dead end then. Amen. A dead end of no return. There's nothing you can do about the situation. Then you have to question the, the sincerity of the offer for you to go and check these things out from the Amen. Word of God. How could you have sincerely offered that when once I've done that, now you won't listen to me? You excommunicate me or disfellowship me or brand me as a rebel or a maverick or a heretic. <laughs> there have been groups that have arisen down through the years and there are many out there today who say that the way of the Lord is a straight and narrow way and we have that way and I haven't found one of them yet who really have the way that they're proclaiming that they have And we're not even going to do that. We're going to be the same as everyone else then. I know that I have part of the straight and narrow way. I know that I have part of it. But everything that we have, even though other people say the same thing, I guess, I guess we can't help it if, if some people say the same things we say, but they're a counterfeit to what we are and to what the truth is that we're going to be sure that everything that we believe is based squarely on the Word of God. Amen. Now, I guess everybody says that. <laughs> but I guess here, here's a point how we can either prove or disprove the sincerity of what they're really saying. If a group, and just about every group, and our group is one of those groups, a group says that everything we believe we're going to be sure and certain and definite that we can base it firmly and squarely on the Word of God not our view or our interpretation we're not going to try to define things we're not going to try to interpret verses in such a way to give us additional proof text for a belief that we've already adopted anyway you know, which is what a lot of people try to do but we're going to squarely and firmly base everything on the Word of God, then those people, whoever those people might be, should never be afraid of any questioning or of any challenges about their contention because only one of two things could be true. Either these people who are questioning are wrong themselves. Amen. And so what do you have to lose to listen to them and then say, but I disagree with you? Or, secondly, these people are right. And if they're right, and you're the one who's saying, your group, that we want to base everything squarely and firmly on the Word of God, then these people are a godsend to you then. 
to tell you that you're wrong about whatever it is you previously were believing and to get you set back on the straight and narrow way. Those are the only two options that we have. Either your critics are right or they're wrong. And neither one should be able to affect you adversely. Amen. Amen. And so that's what we say here. I challenge anyone. And I don't mean that in, you know, the derogatory negative sense like I challenge you to prove me wrong. I openly welcome anyone to prove anything that I've ever said in my teachings from the Word of God to be wrong. I openly welcome. If you can prove me to be wrong, I'll stoop down, unloose your shoes, and kiss your precious feet. Because your feet are the feet of the gospel that brought me the truth in that area then. Hallelujah. How can you really be a child of God and think any other way besides that? That's the way I think about it. Maybe I haven't always thought that way, but I think that way now. I challenge anyone, anyone sitting in this building tonight, anyone who ever hears these tapes, anyone who knows me to prove that I'm wrong. You see, I have to have proof, though. I don't want, well, I don't believe that. Well, I don't care what you believe, <laughs> you see. I could care less what you believe. I believe anybody believes. I want proof. You see, if it's proof, it's proof. For the I challenge anyone, anyone sitting in this building tonight, Anyone who ever hears these tapes, anyone who knows me to prove that I'm wrong. You see, I have to have proof, though. I don't want, well, I don't believe that. Well, I don't care what you believe, you see. I could care less what you believe. I believe anybody believes. I want proof. You see, if it's proof, it's proof. We've been getting off in that area recently. No one should ever be afraid of the facts. The facts aren't going to contradict the Word of God. <laughs> Nothing was going to contradict the word of God unless it's some delusion of some demon or the invention of some man's fertile imagination. I'm not afraid to investigate all the facts of how you can show me that these bones used to belong to a small horse and these bones belong to a medium horse. And now today we have big horses. And so the horse evolved. I'm not afraid to look at that. Bones are bones. But your interpretation of the facts, those are facts, but your interpretation of those facts may be something that I'm not going to follow because it's a false interpretation. We taught you that throughout creation evolution. We're all dealing with the same facts, bones and teeth and strata. We're all dealing with the same facts. Depends on how you interpret those. And I believe we can see through a whole lot of that false interpretation evolution of all species from one little amoeba in a swamp you know i'm going to have to have proof of that that's too outlandish to believe i'm gonna have to have proof and you know one thing i always think of i don't even know if i can readily explain it but how do we end up with two sexes that fit together perfectly to reproduce themselves and you know how did that just happen why not 14 sexes that had to do it 14 different ways to reproduce why one and one fit together and reproduce that's interesting how did they just happen to end up that way? And why weren't we born without eyes? Who says that we have to have eyes? Why was it just the way that it is? Unless there's been a sovereign designer behind the design that we see in creation. Amen. All designs that we know as human beings had a designer. All designs. There is no design that did not have a designer. So if you're going to tell me that now you found one case, the greatest design we know of is the human being, you're going to tell me you found one case that doesn't fit in that pattern, I'm going to have to have overwhelming proof for that then. Because that's the highest design that we see. It's not the moon, that's just a blob up there. But man, he is so complex and so minute, and you're saying of all the things... This, maybe everything else, we can see it had some designer because it has a design. Well, man has a design, but he didn't have a designer, though. I'm going to have to have overwhelming proof. Amen. I would say the burden of proof is on you. Amen. Some people don't know how to argue reasonably and efficiently. When we come to areas like that, when it's something that outstanding, then the burden of the proof is upon you. You can't just use what we call an argument from silence. The burden of proof is upon you. I have to prove nothing from my point of view. Because my point of view is substantiated every day of our life. That a clock didn't just evolve in your room. It has a design. It works. Someone had to make it in order to have that design. So see, I'm already ahead. Amen. 
Amen. I'm already ahead. In order for you to win, you've got to beat me now. See, I start off ahead. <laughs> this evolution business, I start off ahead. Amen. <laughs> and now that I know as much as I do about that, you know, you're never even tempted. You can be brought all of the statistics about evolution, and sometimes you're just floored over the, the wealth of material they can bring. But still, you never spend a moment thinking that maybe it could be some other way than what the Bible says. You never even think that. Amen. Because it's been proven too much. We, I remember giving you so many different examples. I remember giving you one example in creation about, about a certain type of plant that had a poison inside. And a spider would stay on the outside of the plant. And they would protect and work for and help feed and nourish one another. The spider could drop down into that when an enemy came and not hurt him. But something else would fall down into that and would kill them. And the scent and the odor and so forth would attract insects so that the spider could gain his meal. And it was a, a sharing, a relationship. And how could that just happen to work out? It's impossible. It's impossible. You know, someone's even tried to figure up the, you know, the possibility, like sitting a monkey down and getting him to type out a dictionary on the typewriter keys, you know, that type of business. <laughs> Saying, you know, it is possible. It would be possible for a monkey, a chimpanzee, they don't like us to call them monkeys, a chimpanzee to, at random, type out all the numbers in order in a telephone book. I guess that's possible somewhere if you carried it far enough. But evolution's not even possible no matter how far you carry that, though. <laughs> I mean, you'd have to carry it to so many zeros, it's beyond our imagination how a chimpanzee could ever do that, though. Or even just type the English alphabet from the first letter to the last, never being trained or taught, just do it at random. You know, the odds against that. You know when you start getting above two things and you've got to mix three numbers together and then you mix four numbers, it starts going up in astronomical figures in. You know, the choices you have in like say four numbers, by the time you get to eight numbers, it's just gone. And think of when you get up to zillions and trillions of things. Well, I don't know how I got off on that except say there's a good example of us saying, you know, we're going to have to have proof of these things. Amen. We're going to have to have proof. Your word, in other words, is not going to be good enough for me. It shouldn't be for any of us. We just read it's to this word. It's to this word that everything must bow. And everything must conform. Turn over to that verse I just quoted in Romans chapter 10. I sincerely mean that, that we openly challenge and welcome anyone to come and show us that we've taught something that's not of God. Because what could we possibly lose? Your feet have been the feet of the gospel that have brought to us good tidings, good news, the word of God. Amen. Verse 15. How shall they preach except they be sent as it is written? Now he's quoting, I think, from Isaiah 52. How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Amen. You're bordering, you're putting yourself on the border of being a false cult when you just say, now it's going to be my way and I won't listen to anything else but my way. That's bordering on a false cult right away. Because I just don't see that to be true honesty or true humility in any human being, whether you're a theology professor or a mathematics professor, to say it's going to have to be my way and I'm not going to even consider any other options. And then people try to, you know, say, well, does that mean that you would consider bowing to some other Lord besides Jesus? That's really not what we're talking about. We're talking about questions of doctrine that are stated either in the Word of God or that you say are stated in the Word of God. I mean, we're certainly not going to try all the religions of the world and then come back to Christianity just so we can prove how, you know, we tried it your way and your way didn't work. The Bible never teaches that. But my point is the Bible teaches so much, how could any person in their right mind say, I've got it all under my belt now? It only proves they don't know how much the Word of God really teaches. 
or they would never make a statement like that. If you can, I hope that you're to the place. See, I know where my own heart is, where you can say I openly welcome anyone to prove any of my beliefs to be false beliefs. See, I don't even hedge about that saying, well, I know mine are right anyway, but I'll listen to you. I'll give you five moments of my time. I mean, we're not going to let them try to tell us how Jesus really was not the Son of God, but <coughs> Mohammed was. We're not going to talk about things like that, you know. <laughs> we're talking about what we're talking about, what's obvious. Because, I mean, everyone tries to make themselves, well, I'm an authority on the whole Word of God, and I know all about this. The Bible is so complicated. We ought to welcome other people's help in interpreting the Word of God. I mean, there's a good point right there. It's so difficult as it is. You're never going to get it on your own anyway. We ought to welcome anyone's help, everyone's help, whoever can help us. Now, I don't want your harm. I just want your help. Anyone who can help us better understand the Word of God, then why would you not want their help? And you think that you're a Christian? Well, if you don't want people's help in knowing and understanding the Word of God more, how can you be a true child of God who really wants to know the will of your heavenly father Amen. it's there in the word of God but it's hidden in so many different ways it's just hidden in the word of God so I don't even hedge about these things I just openly welcome someone to prove that I've been wrong and like I said I would stoop over unloose their shoe and kiss their precious beautiful feet what do I have to lose? That's right. Except, I guess if you've got pride, you've got some of that to lose. Oh, which Lord. is good to lose all of that. Yeah. Yeah. I guess if you don't have any, then you don't have anything to lose. And the only thing you've really got would be pride. But you're not supposed to have that as a Christian. So if you do, then this is a good area where you can lose it all in a hurry. Someone can prove you to be wrong and you can say, praise God, I was wrong. And I'm glad someone can show me to be wrong so that I can be right from now on. Mm -hmm. And if that person who's coming to you is wrong, then what do you have to lose? You still don't. What, what are you afraid of? People who are secure in their knowledge, they're not afraid to talk about it. It's only these insecure, weak people who are, well, I just won't talk about it. If you're not in our camp, then I won't talk to you. What, what are you afraid of? You must be so shallow and insecure in your beliefs that you might think that I could talk you out of your beliefs. Amen. <laughs> you're in a sad state of affairs if you're that weak of an individual about anything. And you know how religious people are prone to do that. They have certain what we call camps or circles. Generally, they're called camps or circles. We're in this camp or we're in this circle. And if you're not in my camp or my circle, I just won't talk to you then. And, you know, some t in a lot of areas, we don't have to talk to people in other camps and other circles about their beliefs because we read their books and hear their tapes ourselves. So we're still putting ourselves over there. You know, and I found that all these other people won't do the reverse. They won't do that toward us. They'll say things about us, false groups and good groups. They'll say things about us, but it's never from any knowledge that they really have. It's just from what they think they want to say about us because they don't like us because they think we don't like them. And it ends up everything boils down to a personal feud then. And our intention is never a personal feud. It never is from our point of view. It's always a feud over doctrine. It definitely is over doctrine. Someone's right and someone's wrong. Listen, if you're a brother out there, someone's right and someone's wrong. Now, maybe you don't want to be corrected, but I'd like to get together because I do want to be corrected if I happen to be wrong in this case. And does it mean that you have to go all through your Christian life always being doubtful about your beliefs? But until you've got them all proven from the Word of God, then how can you be secure in them? I mean, there are certain things I'm secure in. I don't want to go talk to someone who's got another opinion about that. But I've got to be certain that my security is in the Word of God and not just, well, I've always believed that or that's the way that I've always heard that. And I've heard it like that so many times I've been confirmed in my inaccurate belief that's not based on the Word of God now. I think that's called brainwashing where you hear something so often, so many times, you become confirmed in that belief, even though it's not true. Mm -hmm. It's just that you hear it, and you hear it, and you hear it presented in a certain way along a certain train of thought that's not a true one, 
I mean, we've got to follow trains of thoughts, but they've got to be true ones, though. It's not a true one, and you get confirmed in your inaccurate misconception and interpretation of the Bible. And we've got all of this. I just, Paul's not afraid. He went up to the council of Jerusalem, and they had great discussions over these questions. He didn't say, well, I'm just right. I'm not even going to, you know, I'm not going to waste my time talking to these people. And I'm not suggesting that Paul had any doubt in his beliefs at that time. Uh, sometimes we, I'm not saying we might have doubts, but you're not secure in the belief because it's not total in you. You don't have total understanding about that. Then as long as a person is seeking after the word of God, then you're seeking after the facts of the matter, the facts of the issue. I don't see why a person should be afraid to discuss the matter with anyone then. You know, the book of Proverbs has a lot to say about wisdom and about people who love to gain wisdom and about people who don't. The wise man loves instruction, the book of Proverbs tells us. Proverbs chapter 4. Hear ye children the instruction of a father, and attend to no understanding. I give you good doctrine, forsake ye not my law. Let thine heart retain my words, keep my commandments, and live. Get wisdom, get understanding. Why are some people saying, well, I've got all that I need or all that I want now? He's always saying, get more of it if you can. Amen. Get wisdom, get understanding, forget it not, neither decline from the words of my mouth. Forsake her not, and she shall preserve thee. Love her, and she shall keep thee. Later in Proverbs, we read that she will honor you. Uh, she will fill your house with riches and treasures, just wisdom. Hallelujah. If you'll count her as a sister, I think we read over in chapter 7, and as a near kinswoman. Wisdom is the principal thing. What should we spend all of our time about? I guess whatever is principal. And what have we been accused of wanting to get too much wisdom? Being logical intellectuals. Well, he says that's the principal thing, though. I think they mean a logical intellectual. They mean by that something derogatory. <laughs> but I take it as a compliment. As long as I'm taking it in the right sense, I can see how someone else that could be a derogatory statement about them, a logical intellectual. They won't believe anything unless they can put it in a test tube and analyze it. Well, we're not like that. We won't believe anything until we can see whether it's tested in the Word of God or not. And I guess, I guess you can call that person a logical intellectual. But what's the principal thing? We're criticized. And you know, the, I'm finding out that one group, Faith Assembly, who's criticizing us over things like this, they're the same ones who said now the most important thing is our doctrine because the charismatic movement doesn't have any doctrine. They just float along and believe what everyone else is saying. But we're going to have to study the Word of God and make sure our beliefs are based on the Word of God. And then when we try to do the same thing, they say, oh, you're rebelling against God's ministry now. Mm -hmm. We're doing just what you said is the principal thing to do. Amen. It's labor in the Word and doctrine, labor in the Word and doctrine. And so when Brother Ross comes and tries to do what they say, labor in the Word and doctrine, they say, now you're getting off into areas that are too doctrinal. Well, what did you say? Labor in the Word and doctrine. And they're wanting us to kind of trust more in the Holy Spirit. And that's the same old false conception of the charismatic movement. That's right. Uh, right. You know, it, it's neat how you can have two faces on the same person. Mm -hmm. Whenever you're talking to the charismatic movement, oh, it's labor in the word and doctrine. Because they go by the Spirit. When you're talking to us, oh, and hold, hold steady, brother. <laughs> now let's go by the Spirit of God and see what the Spirit is saying about these matters. Well, you can't have two faces like that and I'm going to trust you. And they turn to someone like us and they interpret everything how it fits them. And God help us if we ever do that. We try our best not to interpret things just like we want them to so we look comfortable in that. We have to interpret them according to the facts and then look at ourselves in light of that. And if we don't look too good, we've got to change. Yeah. You can't then change the doctrine to make yourself look good all over again. It's like the lizard that changes the colors all the time. <laughs> You're one color towards the charismatics. We're faithful to the word of God. 
Then when I try to come and we talk about uh, a pool and Tiglath Pelneser, well, now wait a minute, now wait a minute, that's getting too doctrinal. Well, that's the word, though. That's right in the Bible. You're saying, now let's be more of the Spirit. You need to teach more. Where, why don't you have any messages on faith and divine healing and, you know, let's get into the spirit of these things more. You see, you can't win with someone like that unless you do it exactly the way they want you to. You have to be in their camp or their circle. They won't let you be a charismatic way over there or a logical intellectual like we are. You have to get right in their camp, right in their circle. And that's not fair and that's not the way to do it. We do spend a lot of time. You know, I was telling someone the other night because I trust that, or maybe you don't know this, let me tell you if you don't know, don't think that the reason that Brother Ross likes to get into all these historical things and he's just always done that ever since he first came to the church is because he's just like that naturally. He's always been like that. And therefore, you know, it's, it's a temptation for him not to, you know, to, to get into that so much that he doesn't lean on the Holy Spirit. Dear friends, I'm thinking all the time, Lord, are we going, you know, too technical into these matters? Is this too far? Should I be preaching a message and shouting more and talking about more general subjects? If you don't know that goes through my mind or not, then know it hereafter. That does go through my mind. I'm not the type who just, I just like to do this and kind of wish I really wasn't saved. I really wish I was a history professor in a college somewhere because this is what I really, that's not me. The reason I do it this way is because I think that this is the only way that you're going to be able to stay true is to do it this way. Many times my heart kind of cries out, Lord, I wish that we could do something else, you know. And sometimes I kind of think that I'd take that in some other people here. You know, if we just could have a more free message about healing or faith or something and have more of those, like maybe twice a week or three times a week to encourage all of us more. And kind of, that's kind of what other people are saying and other people are thinking. And you know what? I'm for that 100%. If, if you can show me where that's worked from day one to day end in someone's ministry. Amen. And I was telling someone, some brothers I was speaking with the other evening who were over at the home, you know, I've never, you know, I, I would really, it'd be a temptation to keep looking and thinking in that area. If I could find a ministry who was able to forget about, you know what we study around here, forget about that type of thing. I mean, they even, some groups have even studied things like Old Testament introduction, but it's not like we did. You use the book so you can get to a verse over there in Second Chronicles about divine healing and Asa sought to the physicians and, and whenever he sought to them, he died because of this disease. And really you want to get to that so that you spend maybe 20 minutes of your teaching on divine healing. You see, that's not the way we do it around here. Obviously, little comments come out here and there about some issue whenever we're talking about something technical. But we don't get into a book so I can get over there to my verse, 2 Corinthians 1.20, and I'm really not going to teach that chapter, 2 Corinthians 1. I'm wanting to get to that 20th verse. So I can say all the promises of God in Christ are yea and amen. And so that I can mystically tie that into 3 John 2 because our critics say, now wait a minute, 3 John 2, that was written to Gaius. But I like 2 Corinthians 1.20 because then I say all the promises are mine. Doesn't this sound neat like third grade education? This sounds real neat. All of them are mine. So although that was made to Gaius, since 2 Corinthians 1.20 says they're all mine, that promise is mine also. Ha, 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 ha. And there goes a 30-minute message then. I think, why well, a third grader could have gotten that. And I recognize when we all come into this truth, we're not even in kindergarten. We're so dumb from the system. And we need, we need to be told things like that. Because you read that book and see Gaius, well, I guess I can close it. My name's not Gaius. <laughs> and you needed someone to tell you all the promises are yours. All those made to Gaius are made to you. That's fine. We all need to be told that, but not when they're 12th grade. <laughs> come on now, not when they're 12th grade. Unless you're just doing it over to remind and encourage everyone. But I can tell where people can hardly wait to get to that little favorite charismatic verse and take off on it for the umpteenth time. I haven't figured out what number that is, but it's a high one. For the umpteenth time to get off on that again. And it just drives me batty, I told someone the other day, and it really does. It drives me up the wall. I tell my wife just about every week, I wish I was at that church. I'd stand up and say, shut up! Shut up! Leave me alone! 
You're wearing my bones by telling me that same verse all the time. I don't know if you know what a disservice we're not doing to you around here by doing that type of thing. You might think you'd enjoy that, but that gets old after a while. Hearing 2 Corinthians 1.20 every week. Just preaching and preaching. You'd say, Brother Ross, shut up. You drive me up the wall. I already know that. You're treating me like I'm a numbskull. We treat you people with intelligence here. We go over things, and sometimes I've only made one reference to something, and I come right back to it and say, and I hope we all remember that. And some people treat their, their pupils like they were ignoramuses. Now, let me tell you, do you know that 2 Corinthians 1.20 is in the Bible? You just shake your head in disbelief. I mean, I guess it could be said every week if it's in the right train of thought and the right, it's presented the right way, like the Apostle Paul, I guess you could. But not like, you know, you can just tell that that's someone's favorite little thing to hop over to. You know what that makes me? That makes me distrustful of anything else that you have to say then. I don't really trust in your exposition of other passages, like maybe the 19th and the 21st verse, whenever I can see your whole energy is geared toward that one thing. Because you hate the denomination so much, you're trying to prove them so wrong every week that you just keep harping on things that should be old hat to all of us. I love the verse. I love to be reminded, wow, every promise in the word is answered with a yes for me. I enjoy hearing that. So don't misunderstand me. You know, they, they tell us, well, you, you're not in the faith message. You're not in the divine healing message. Well, I, I guess we're not in it like you are. But I love the verse just as much as you love that verse. Maybe I love it more. Maybe I love it in a different way than you love it. Maybe I have a deeper appreciation. But I know one thing. It would drive me batty to be preached down to in that way three times a week. The same group, listen to this, who criticizes the denominations for preaching John 3.16 three times a week. And you preach Mark 11.24 three times a week. <laughs> What's the difference then? You're not being fair and honest now. You're reinterpreting everything to fit your own ministry. Amen. It's wrong for someone else. You know, this is really, people can see through if they're looking. It's wrong for someone else to do this, but I can do it. I'm special now. I can do it. Why is it wrong for the denominations, the evangelical denominations, to preach John 3.16 to people who already are saved three times a week, which these people are saying, why is it wrong to do that and yet it's right for you to preach Mark 11.24 to people three times a week who already have Mark 11.24? I would say they're exactly the same. Yep. Right. You could say, well, we need to be reminded. Well, why don't you have John 3.16? With reminding yourself of that then. God so loved the whole world that he gave Jesus for me that I won't perish but I'll have everlasting life. That is more of a blessing in the final analysis than Mark 11:24. Amen. Right. It surely is. So how can you say someone else is at fault for doing that, but you can preach Mark 16? Well, we know that these signs will follow them that believe. And all we charismatics just memorize. Now, did you notice it didn't say all signs, these signs will follow ministers or apostles or first century Christians, but those that believe. Some of you are laughing. You've heard all this so many times. And it's a neat little charismatic package of theology yep. that's got the wrong, wrong spirit and the wrong train of thought behind it. And some of it's just out and out false. We've told you about Mark 16. We studied that. As the charismatics that I know, they'll say, no, we're not even, we know that some people say that this portion shouldn't be in the Bible. We, that's just like the devil to take out all the miraculous. So we're not even going to study that. We just know that it should be there. You're so dumb to think that way. That's so dumb. You're so self-centered. You don't want anything taken out of the Bible that you've already found a place for in your neat, prepackaged, charismatic theology. 
And I can tell you, and again, to challenge anyone in the right sense of the word to prove this otherwise, I don't care what verses we have to take out if they're not in the manuscripts. Take Mark 16, and I don't need Mark 16. Amen. I don't need it if God didn't give it to me. I only need what he gave. If he didn't give Mark 16, I don't need it. I don't want it. But that's heresy even to say that to some people. Say, now you shouldn't present it like that. This is the only true way that I know of to present it. I only want what God intends for me to have. If he never inspired the Apostle Mark to write that, then I don't want it because I don't need it. Amen. I don't need these signs will follow them that believe. I don't need speaking in tongues if it's not for today. If God doesn't intend for people in the 20th century to have it, I don't need it then. I don't want it. I only want what he intends for us to have, what the word of God says. How are we going to know when we're back to Isaiah 8.20? It's to the word. It's to the word we're going to have to go. And then that brings us a little step further. The word isn't just the arrangement that you have in your English Bible here. This is something else that I can say. I can't communicate in one sentence the depth of everything that's there if you study it in its historical context, in its grammatical context. That's the way. We don't interpret the Bible charismatically. We interpret it conservatively. We interpret it as fundamentals. We interpret it based on its grammar, based on the history, based on the intent, based on the messenger who brought the message, based on the times in which it was given. It has to be based on all of that. Or you're not practicing proper hermeneutical skills and interpretation of the Word of God. This message will be continued.